We would like you to turn to the book of 1 Kings, chapter number 13. 1 Kings, chapter number 13. And when you do have that chapter, we're going to ask you, if you would, to read out loud with me from verse 1 down to about verse 3. And then we're going to skip about some other areas. If you have that, just say, I got it. I got it. All right. We're going to ask you, if you would, to just read out loud with me. 1 Kings chapter 13, beginning at verse 1, and we'll read down to verse number 3. Ready? Read. And behold, there came a man of God out of Judah by the word of the Lord unto Bethel. And Jeroboam stood by the altar to burn incense. And he cried against the altar in the word of the Lord and said, O altar, altar, thus saith the Lord, Behold, a child shall be born unto the house of David, Josiah by name, and upon thee shall he offer the priests of the high places that burn incense upon thee, and men's bones shall be burned upon thee. And he gave a sign the same day, saying, This is the sign which the Lord has spoken. Behold, the altar shall be rent, and the ashes that are upon it shall be poured out. My God, we're going to use for a subject title today, the mouth of the prophet. Everybody say out loud with me, say the mouth of the prophet. The mouth of the prophet. We're going to read a little further later on, but I just wanted to kind of set this scenario up for you so you can see what's going on here. First of all, going back in history just a little bit, we want to talk a little bit about King Solomon. King Solomon was the son of David and he uh, succeeded David on the throne. And God had given King Solomon an option. He said that if you would ask anything of me, I will let you have it. And he did not ask for riches, but he asked for wisdom. And he wanted to know how to have understanding to lead God's people. And of course, Solomon started off, seems like he had a really good heart after God. But God said to Solomon, he said that if you were to turn away from me and turn uh, and, and worship idols and begin to turn and to the women and, uh, and do all of the, the things that the, the other nations are doing, he said, then I will have to turn my blessings away from you and I will take the kingdom away. And so what he says here is that uh, Solomon would be able to govern the people and he would still have great riches. Well, as time went on, Solomon, of course, you know, he had many women, many wives, and these women came from other countries that served idols and other gods. And so when Solomon brought them into Israel and he began to really just uh, turn more away from God as he began to worship the idols of his wives that came from foreign countries. His heart turned further away from God, and then he began to worship idols. And so a prophetic message came to him once again, and it says that he would have his kingdom uh, split in half. And that what would happen was that the majority of those of Israel would come under the power of a servant of King Solomon. Well, time goes on, and this is exactly what happened. The servant of King Solomon, of course, was a man by the name of Nebat, and Nebat had uh, defected from Israel because he had been mistreated by King Solomon. So he went into Egypt for refuge. Nebat had a son by the name of Jeroboam. And Jeroboam uh, was, was one who uh, had a prophecy to come to him later, and it says that Jeroboam would take the 10 tribes and they would come under him. And so Jeroboam, not even being a, a, a true Israelite, not even being a true Hebrew, uh, but yet this would be the fulfilling of a prophetic message where God would show that he does not like idolatry and that he would take the kingdom and split it in half. When this happened, we find that King Solomon's son, Rehoboam, came to the throne of Solomon. And when Rehoboam came to the throne, of course, the, the people began to come around him and they wanted to uh, know how, did he, how would he govern them. And he began to talk to the people and he had a very stern voice apparently and he took the counsel of the 
younger men rather than the older men. The older men say, now, real bone, if you were to serve the people and bless the people and not be so much like King Solomon, your father, who really made things hard for the people, he said, the people will serve you and they will, they will, they will treat you well. And so he abandoned the counsel of the older men and he went to the counsel of his peers. And his peers began to say that if you were to be rigid and if you were to be stern, then you would make the people serve you. And then he went out and he began to say that he was going to uh, make things harder than even his father did. And this caused the people to be very upset. The word got all the way to Jeroboam, who was still in Egypt. And when he found out about this, he comes and he begins to wonder, OK, um, what is Rehoboam going to do? So when this came to him, the prophetic message came to Jeroboam that he was going to uh, take the kingdom and take the ten tribes, he then caused them to split up. And when Jeroboam uh, took ten tribes into the north, and these people forsook Rehoboam, the son of Solomon. And so now what we find is that Jeroboam has the ten tribes and then the tribe of Judah and a portion of Benjamin was still in the southern kingdom with Rehoboam. All right? Hope y'all getting catching this. But what I want you to understand is that while Jeroboam was, was, was ruling over the people, he began to believe that if they were to go back to Jerusalem to worship at Jerusalem during the feast days, that the people were going to turn against him and then they were going to go back to Jerusalem and go back to Judah and they would begin to uh, follow Rehoboam. Well, because he felt he was threatened in that way and he still wanted to have that control, he began to tell the people, look, we're going to build some idols. <laughs> I'm going to show you who your gods really are. And being that he had been in Egypt, guess what? He built two golden calves. And when he built those two golden calves, he put one in Dan and put one in Bethel. And he said, these are the gods that brought your forefathers out of Egypt. And the people actually began to worship those idols. And so when they began to worship idols and Jeroboam thought he had control over the people and he began to worship idols and set up more idol gods, he set up this particular altar and he began to burn incense on the altar. He set up some illegitimate priests and said that these would be the priests of the people. And so you, they, they weren't even people who were of the Leviticus tribe. And so he, he brought all of this idolatry into Israel and turn the people's heart against God. And while that was going on, it says here that there was a man of God. That's where we pick up in chapter 13. That there was a man of God that came out of Judah. And the man of God came out of Judah and he began to prophesy against the altar of Jeroboam. And when he began to prophesy, he said that there's going to be a child born from Judah. And he's going to come along one day. His name is Josiah by name. And he's going to burn the bones of the false prophets upon this altar and all of the all of the idols are going to be torn down. And he said, and I'm going to show you a sign that this thing is going to come to pass, that this altar is going to split in half and all the ashes shall flow out. And no sooner than he could say that, that's exactly what happened. The altar that he was he was uh, speaking against is split in half and all the ashes fell out. Now, let's see what happens after that. It says here that it came to pass when King Jeroboam heard the saying of the man of God, which he had cried against the altar in Bethel, that he put forth his hand from the altar, saying, Lay hold on him. And his hand, which he put forth against him, dried up, so that, the, so that he could not pull it in again to him. The altar also was rent, and the ashes poured out from the altar according to the sign which the man of God had given by the word of the Lord. And so you see what happens? He began to see that the man of God was telling the truth. The altar broke in half. The ashes came out just like the man of God says. But what he wanted to do was he wanted to arrest the man of God, get rid of him. So he said, seize him. And he couldn't pull his hand back. 
His hand got stuck and it started to, 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 to just, just dry up. And he couldn't pull his own hand back. And guess what he did? It says here in verse number six, he said to the man of God, pray for me. <laughs> pray for me that I can get my hand back. The man of God prayed for him and his hand came back whole. <laughs> and then in verse number seven, it says that the king said unto the man of God, come home with me and refresh yourself and I will give thee a reward. And the man of God said unto the king, if thou will give me half thine house, I will not go in with thee. Neither will I eat bread nor drink water in this place. For so was it charged me by the word of the Lord saying, Eat no bread, nor drink water, nor turn again by the same way that thou comest. So he went another way and returned by the way that he came to Bethel. Now, he was speaking what the word of the Lord had been given to him already. He knew what God had said to him. Everybody say he knew what God told him. He knew what God told him. And he quoted the same thing that the Lord had said to him. Even when the king said, all right, I like you now. I want you to come to my house and I want you to sit down and eat and drink with me. No matter how good that sounded, the man of God said, no, I'm not going to come to you. I don't care what you give me. I'm going to have to do what God told me to do. God told me that I'm supposed to come by this way and I'm supposed to carry out my assignment. I'm not supposed to stop here to eat or drink anything with anybody, but I have to stay on my assignment from the Lord. So I can't stop and eat and drink with you, O king. So he headed on off a different direction from the way that he came. And it says here in verse number 11, now there dwelt an old prophet. Everybody say an old prophet. Old prophet. In Bethel. And his sons came and told him all the works that the man of God had done that day in Bethel. The words which he had spoken unto the king, which uh, them spoke to the king, them they told also to their father. And their father said unto them, What way went he? For his sons had seen what the man of God, where the man of God went, which came from Judah. And he said unto his sons, Saddle me the ass. So they saddled him the ass, and he rode thereon. Down to verse number 15. Then he said unto him, Come home with me and eat bread. And he said, I may not return with thee, nor go in with thee, neither will I eat bread nor drink water with thee in this place. For it was told, or it was said to me by the word of the Lord, thou shalt not, thou shalt eat no bread, nor drink water there, nor turn again to go by the way that thou camest. And he said unto him, I am a prophet also, as thou art. And an angel spoke unto me by the word of the Lord, saying, bring him back with thee into thine house that he may eat bread and drink water, but he lied unto him. So he went back with him and did eat bread in his house and drank water. So it came to pass. Verse number 21, it says, uh, verse number 20 says, it came to pass as they sat at the table that the word of the Lord came unto the prophet that brought him back. <laughs> And he cried unto the man of God that came from Judah, saying, Thus says the Lord, for as much as thou hast disobeyed the mouth of the Lord and hast not kept the commandment which the Lord thy God commanded thee, but came back and hast eaten bread and drunk water in the place of which the Lord did say to thee, Eat no bread and drink no water. Thy carcass shall not come unto the sepulcher of thy fathers. Oh my goodness. Now the, now the old man is prophesying to him. Verse number 24. I'm going to skip down there. It says, when he was gone, it says, a lion met him by the way and slew him. And his carcass was cast in the way. And the ass stood by it. The lion also stood by the carcass. And behold, Men passed by and saw the carcass cast in the way and the lion standing by the carcass. And they came and told it in the city which, or where the old prophet dwelt. And when the prophet that brought him back from the way heard thereof, he said, It is the man of God who was disobedient unto the word of the Lord. Therefore the Lord has delivered him unto the lion which has torn him and slain him according to the word of the Lord, 
which he spoke unto him. And he spoke to his son, saying, Saddle me the ass, and they saddled him. And he went and found his carcass cast in the way, and the ass and the lion standing by the carcass. The lion had not eaten the carcass, nor torn the ass. Now, it also mentions later on that, uh, well, I'm going to go ahead and read this if you don't mind. Y'all be patient with me, all right? I'll, I need to read this. It says in verse 30, that he laid his carcass in his own grave. They mourned over him, saying, Alas, my brother. And it came to pass, after he had buried him, that he spoke to his son, saying, When I am dead, then bury me in the sepulcher wherein the man of God is buried. Lay my bones beside his bones. For the saying which he cried by the word of the Lord against the altar in Bethel and against all the houses of the high places which are in the cities of Samaria shall surely come to pass. Amen. Well, I know that's a lot of reading, but just so that you can get a good gist of what it's actually saying and so you'll know that this is in, in the scripture, we just want to kind of sum up what's going on and the reason why it's important for us to know this today. First of all, we see that this man of God came to Bethel and he came and he spoke against the altar and everything that he said would come to pass. As a matter of fact, if you read on through the Bible, you'll see that many years later, the son of Hezekiah or, and the grandson of Hezekiah, King Hezekiah, his name was Josiah. And Josiah really did tear down the altars of the, of the idols and, and he burned the, the bones of the false prophets right there exactly like this man of God said. But the thing about it is, this man of God goes on his way to accomplish the mission of the Lord, but he comes across uh, a, a man who is an older gentleman and this older gentleman comes up to him after he has stopped by a tree and then it says that the older gentleman said, uh, come and eat with me. And he said, no, I can't come and eat with you because the Lord told me I can't stop here and eat and drink. But he said, it's all right because I'm a prophet too. And when uh, and, and an angel came to me and said that you can come and eat and, and drink with me. So he goes on and eats and drinks with him. And the old prophet, while they were sitting there eating and drinking, he began to prophesy right there at the table and he said, because you were disobedient to the word of God that came to you, your carcass is going to be uh, rent by a lion. And that, and that he would be there. And, and so he began to, uh, the next thing you know, he, he said, saddle him an ass and let him, let him ride on his way. And as he was traveling, a lion comes out and attacks him. And when the lion attacks him and kills him, his body just laid there. And people came by and they ridiculed and they, uh, they shook their heads as they were coming by and say, isn't this the man of God? How could this happen to a man of God who prophesied so powerfully, who, who worked so powerfully, these, these great works, and how could this happen to him? Did he make a mistake? What happened? I believe that as we get to understanding some things about a prophet, What's a true prophet? What's a false prophet? And how can we recognize that? I, I think it would be, help us to understand a little bit more about what was going on in this story right here. First of all, I want us to think about this. Because sometimes people ask this question. Can a true prophet give false information? Some people will ask, can a false prophet give true information? Well, we're going to answer that in just a moment for you. But the first thing I want us to do when we're talking about a false prophet and a true prophet, let's look at the characteristics of both. First, I want to look at the characteristics of a false prophet. And as you read through the scriptures, you begin to see these things for yourself. Characteristics of a false prophet is someone who is A, subtle and convincing. Everybody say subtle and convincing. You see, that's, that's the trick of the devil. He's got to convince you if he's a false prophet, if he's going to pretend to be what he's not, then he's going to be subtle. He's going to be convincing. He's going to say the things that will draw you to him and make you believe him if only you can. Letter B. He has a selfish motive. The false prophet always has a selfish motive. That means that the false prophet has 
an agenda. The false prophet knows that what he really wants to do is get attention. He really wants to get noticed. In fact, a lot of times uh, there, there are people, and this is why I would say, really watch your mouth because see, many of us have prophetic gifts. And if you got prophetic gifts, you need to realize that it came from God. And it's a, it's a, it's a message from God. This is not a, a, a thing that we should play with. It's not my gift. It's not your gift. It's the gift from God, and you become a gift to the people that you serve. And so understand that we can't go out there always uh, trying to fulfill our own desires and our own motives and our own uh, selfish agendas. Many times we may even hear people saying things like, oh, the Lord said this and the Lord said that and thus saith the Lord and God told me to tell you this and look like they're saying that all the time. And most of the time when you hear that, it's because somebody really wants to manipulate or control you. You have, to, you have to notice that that's a big difference in a, a prophet of God. A prophet of God does not want to manipulate and control you. A person, uh, we are sent here so that we can give guidance, give direction, and edify, build up, and strengthen people, but never to control people. Sometimes, we, you know, if we're selfish, we'll want to get our way. And if we want to get our way, sometimes we would say things like, uh, God said, do this. And you know that when people hear God say do this, that they're going to just up and do it because they say, I don't want to I don't want to be disobedient to God. But oftentimes when you have a selfish desire or selfish motive, that's exactly what you will do. And so that's the reason why I want to warn us today that when we're using our mouths and saying God said this and God said that sometimes God is not saying sometimes God is not saying. And sometimes God is saying, and even if God is saying something, we don't always have to tell people that God is saying it. Because oftentimes, it's just a matter of people being obedient to what, they have no wisdom, they have no direction from the Lord, but we don't always have to try to force people to do things just by us saying the Lord said. Let's, let's go to, I'm, I'm going to hold your point right there, but I want us to go to uh, Deuteronomy chapter 13 just for a moment. And I'm going to come back to that, those points. You see some things about false prophets. You see, a false prophet knows he's a false prophet. <laughs> All right. Verse number, uh, chapter 13, I want us to look at verse number one down to verse maybe five. We're in Deuteronomy chapter 13. Here it says, if there arise among you a prophet or a dreamer of dreams and, and giveth thee a sign or a wonder and the sign or the wonder come to pass whereof he spoke unto thee saying let us go after other gods which thou hast not known and let us serve them. Thou shalt not hearken unto the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams. For the Lord your God proveth you to know whether you love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. You shall walk after the Lord your God and fear him and keep his commandments and obey his voice and you shall serve him and cleave unto him. And that prophet or that dreamer of dreams shall be put to death because he had spoken to turn you away from the Lord your God, which brought you out of the land of Egypt and redeemed you out of the house of bondage to thrust thee out of the way which the Lord thy God commanded thee to walk in. So shall thou put the evil away from the midst of thee. So sometimes even a false prophet may say things that will come to pass. Now I say a false prophet, but here's what I want you to understand is both of these men in this, in this story today, it didn't say they were false prophets, it just said that they were prophets or men of God. But when a person begins to become self-serving, prideful, and thinking that, hey, I can do nothing wrong, that person may then turn his gift that has been given to him to serve himself, and then he begins to do like this man in the story, lie, <laughs> because he wants to get his way. And so, so that's what I'm talking about. A false prophet has selfish motives. 
Letter C, a false prophet steers people from God and the scriptures, just like what we just read in Deuteronomy. A false prophet will draw your attention away from God and away from the scriptures. There have been times I've even had people to say things or heard people say things like, uh, you know, everything that, that God said, you, you, won't, you won't be able to back it up with scripture. Sometimes God speaks to me in a different way. Somebody actually said that to me and I said, what do you mean speaks to you in a different way? Well, you know, uh, you know, uh, I, I have this deep uh, relationship with the Lord and, 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 and I know how God talks to me and he'll say things to me that he don't normally say to other people. I said, no, nah, that ain't right. <laughs> because the Bible said there is nothing that God gives that's a private interpretation. That he's not going to give somebody something and he's not going to let others know. Amen? Amen? His purpose is to let his people know his secrets. And they are only secrets to those who are lost. All right? Next, false prophet seeks a following. False prophet seeks a following for themselves. They want to they gather people to themselves. They want to have, have others to come to them. And that, gives, that strokes their ego. Because they really just want to get a following, getting people to, to, to follow after them. And so that they can look like they are you know, high and lifted up. And they got all these people that's coming after them because they can really easily control people who are not well-rounded and well-versed in the word of God. See, that's the reason why I'm always saying stay in the word, stay in the word. Make sure that you're studying the word for yourself because, see, you can easily be deceived, especially in these days, if you're not in the word of God because there are some clever people out there that would draw you away from God. Now, characteristics of a true prophet. First of all, characteristics of a true prophet is somebody who is, who has humility. The proof, true prophet has humility. What is humility? Humility means that they depend on God. Somebody who yields to God. They don't, they don't have a word from, for themselves and they're not going to go around trying to claim that this is my word, this is me. But, but, a, but a true prophet of God is somebody who has humility. Because they depend on the Lord. B, a true prophet of God seeks the benefit of others. The scripture tells us that a, that a prophet is to edify the church. To edify the people of God. Edify means to strengthen. Edify means to give you uh, things that's going to benefit you. It's not always about benefiting myself.